I'm Amy Gorin, and I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Deborah Furholden today. Uh, Dr. Furholden was supposed to join us back in March, and we are so thrilled that she was able to reschedule at such a busy time, um, but she's here with us today to kick off our lecture series. Dr. Furholden joins us from Michigan State University, where she was the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration, uh, the CS Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health, and where she serves as Director of MSU's Division of Public Health. She is also the Director of the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions that's funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Furholden earned her PhD in Public Health from John Hopkins and is a leading expert in drug and alcohol dependence epidemiology, psychiatric epidemiology, and prevention science. Uh, for the past two decades, she has been conducting research addressing behavioral health inequities. And in this research, she has worked tirelessly with a range of partners from community-based organizations up to policy makers. Dr. Furholden's community-based action-oriented research, um, some of which she's going to share with us today, has driven multiple policy interventions that address some of the nation's greatest health, public health challenges. We are so very thankful to have Dr. Furholden with us today, and I'm going to turn things over to her now with a reminder that we do have some time for questions at the end via the chat feature um, on YouTube. So welcome, Dr. Deborah Furholden. Thank you, Amy. I think it's uh, now I'm screen sharing. Let's see. This is very cool. I have the YouTube live chat up as well. Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work I've done and I'm going to kind of set a foundation because what I've found is that especially in this era where we've seen tremendous disparities in COVID, which has shined a light on disparities in other areas, that I want to make sure that we're all sort of in the same conversation. So I want to start by giving a little bit of background um, and making sure that, again, we're all in the same conversation. So I want to first define uh, what I mean when I say health disparities. And there's sort of two ways to think about it, very similar. I'm gonna give you the classic Healthy People 2020 definition, um, where health disparities are defined as a particular type of health difference that's closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. I like the definition of my very good colleague and friend, Dr. Kamar Jones, who defines health disparities as the differences in outcomes. And she takes it a step further and she says, when health disparities are eliminated, i.e. those differences that we see that are linked to these social, economic, and environmental factors, then health equity will be achieved. And people oftentimes will use the term health disparity and health equity or health inequity or health disparities interchangeably. So I wanna also distinguish what I mean when I say health equity. Um, Healthy People 2020 define health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Again, I think this is an important distinction that Dr. Jones makes, and she defines health equity as the assurance of the con condition of optimal health for all people. So the reason I think the distinction is important is because I think of attainment as almost like a destination, like you're going on vacation, we're going to Acapulco. Health equity is not a place that we get to, it's more of an, a, a, um, a process and a value and so I like her definition, and it seems like maybe a trivial nuance, but I don't think that it is. I think the work of assuring that the conditions exist for optimal health for all people is an important distinct distinction when talking about health equity. Um, and then the last thing is I wanna distinguish that from the social determinants of health. And again, it's because we're sort of now in, in this era where people are talking about a lot of these things but I feel like somehow times how they're used and how they get operationalized and then what we do as a function of that are a little bit off. So I want to, again, distinguish that. So again, going back to Healthy People 2020, which was sort of our blueprint for understanding these um, concepts, Healthy People 2020 define, not 2010, Healthy People 2020 define the social determinants of health as the conditions within the environments that people are born, live, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risk. Um, those conditions in these environments have also been referred to as place. And there are these material features of and attributes of place 
that also include the patterns of social engagement, a sense of security and well-being, and all of those things that are also affected by where people live. And where people live is also even bigger than just things like neighborhood or your home. It's also the social and political environment in which we live, because we know that those things are primary drivers of health and health outcomes. And what we often say is that the social, and sometimes there's now sort of a new movement, and Daniel Dawes, um, who worked, was, was instrumental in the Affordable Care Act, has a new book coming out um, called The Social and Political Determinants of Health. Um, we know that these factors are oftentimes as important, if not more important, than the individual level determinants of health. And one of the examples I like to point to is we've done a lot of work and we now realize that your zip code is a much stronger factor in your health and your health outcomes than even your genetic code. So even the things that we think of as sort of pre-programmed and biological determinism, we're now understanding are in large part and maybe even in the largest part influenced by these factors that are even outside of the individual. I always say framework matters. I love this slide. I use it often. It was one slide, I broke it down because I think it really tells a, a, a good story and it makes it sort of very easy to see the, the point that I'm making. So here what you see is you got these three guys, they're all at the baseball game um, and you can see there's a fence up. And so imagine that the game is health or access or opportunities for optimal health. That's what's on the field, opportunities for optimal health. And you can see there's this barrier, there's a fence. And then you've got three different people of different heights. And so in an equality model, and, and some people will say, well, that's sort of silly, because if you look, the taller guy doesn't even need a box to be able to see over the fence. The middle guy, that box got him so that he had access to optimal health. And then the little guy, that one box still isn't quite enough. And so he's still marginalized and not able to see the game or um, have access to optimal health. And we've done this in the past. We've seen how we allocate resources. And I'm going to talk a lot about allocation of resources because I think it's a critical factor um, in a conversation for how we move towards a more um, equitable society. Um, but if, if, if you um, sort of think about it, we, we used to do things like, and I lived in Baltimore City for a long time, I was at Hopkins, and there were programs um, anchored around behavioral health. And we had 24 jurisdictions, 23 counties in the city of Baltimore, and they would just take whatever the pie of money was, and they would divide it by 24, and everybody got the same thing. But in the equality model, it doesn't quite fit, because giving everybody the same thing doesn't necessarily give everybody what they need. A more equity-focused approach is that, again, we're talking about an assurance that people have what they need to experience optimal health. You can see in this model, the little guy there gets the two boxes because that's actually what he needs to be able to see the game. The guy in the middle gets one box, the taller guy, he doesn't need a box. He already has what he needs to be able to see the game, um, even over the fence. And, and I always tell people there's no value judgment to any of this. Um, it's really about sort of understanding the different way that we frame and then um, approach health. And I will tell you, I, the first time I presented this in Flint, people were sort of up in arms. You know, they went, I thought they'd go, rah, rah, yeah, that makes sense, equity. But then, you know, people are interrupting me and they're asking questions and somebody says, well, I want to know how that little guy get up there. So, so somebody brought the two boxes. Did the tall guy have to pick them up and put them up there, you know, like that's not fair. People should be able to maintain their dignity and all of that. And, and even the fact that he even needs the boxes is unfair. Why don't they just get rid of the fence? Why don't they remove the barrier so that he doesn't need a handout or a hand up? And so that's what the nuance that I like to make as we think about the social determinants of health. And clearly the fence provides something. It stops the balls from rolling over, et cetera. But in this model, this sort of social um, determinants framework, you can see that the sort of barrier for people to be able to access the game have been removed. And it doesn't matter how tall you are, everybody has fair opportunity now um, to see the game. So that's just a little bit of a, um, a foundation. Um, and so what, when I talk from here on out about disparities, I want you to think of disparities as the differences 
um, think of disparate disparities as very person centered and also downstream. And I'm going to distinguish that in just a second. So downstream. And when we talk about inequities, I'm talking about unfairness, right? So it's unfair to have that fence up and in, in such that only really tall people can, can see over the fence, right? It's also related to the systems and the structures, and it tends to be intervention centered. And the interventions are mostly focused on the systems and the structures. And again, go back to the example of the fence, just getting rid of that wooden fence and putting up a, a mesh fence now everybody has access to the game and it's more upstream. So how do we identify and track disparities? And I'm gonna come back to this and talk about how we then intervene. The first thing is you have to disaggregate the data. And I know this might seem simple and probably fairly straightforward to a lot of folks, but I oftentimes meet with county health departments. I've met with other researchers who are not sort of steeped in the, the context and the framework of health disparities or health equity. And they said, well, where do we start? And I said, just start by first disaggregating the data. You know, a lot of this stuff is sort of hidden in plain sight, but it's not hidden from the people who are living the experience of having barriers, um, very real barriers to optimal health. Um, and don't control or adjust the way the disparity. I, I, I too have been guilty of this. I was trained in graduate school and, you know, I sort of threw things into a model and control them away or adjusted them away. And, and in some sense, they were nuisance variables or noise variables, not understanding that they were the things um, that we really needed to be focused on. And then the last thing is a good scientist and a good scholar. I always tell people, just let the data um, speak for itself. It's one thing to come in with a hypothesis. It's another thing to come in um, with an agenda. All right, so upstream versus downstream. These terms come out of the, and I promise this is the last little bit of foundation and then we're gonna jump in and I'm gonna give you an explicit example that's very relevant to some of the things that we're dealing with right now. So this actually comes out of the geolo geology literature and the term upstream in geology, they call it upriver, refers to the direction towards the source of the river i.e. in our framework, it's the systems, the structures, and you can even think of them as the core values that give way to everything that flows from there. And the term downstream, or in the geology world, downriver, describes the direction towards the mouth of the river. Um, and so in our world, that would be more like the community context where people live, work, play, worship, go to school, and it's more of the sort of individual um, kind of determinants that we focus on oftentimes when we're trying to intervene. And I'll put this in a better context in just a sec. So in an, a model around upstream thinking, and I love this graphic because um, it really sort of brings it home and it's very simple. And this is something that I borrowed from our Canadian um, colleagues at the Health Quality Council. If you think about it upstream, and typically when you go to the source of the river, it's, it's the most narrow point. And as you get down to the mouth, things start to get much wider. And what we oftentimes do is we don't sort of clog the dam at the top of the river and stop people from going in. And so you can see the, the guys sort of trying to fish people out of the river. And you've got sort of midstream, you've got hospitals and systems of care. And then all the way downstream, you've got an ambulance. The further downstream we go with the solutions, the, typically the more expensive the solutions are. The kinds of things that we implement upstream, the policies, the structural changes, the systematic changes, those are things that shape the context and sort of serve as a bridge or a dam, if you will, for stopping people from even going into the river. But by most of what we do, and by the time people are downstream, we're talking about very um, high need and very expensive um, solutions to solve those problems. So in moving from disparities to equity, I, it's like a very simple three-step process for me. The first thing to do is to identify what is the disparity. And where we identify disparities are always downstream. Women are at greater risk for this. People with language barriers have a higher prevalence of that. African Americans are overrepresented here. The data are there and the data do tell us something. 
And mostly when we identify disparities, where we see them is downstream. Because if you actually go upstream, there's really not a lot of people at the top of the river. Most of what we see in disparities, we're seeing downstream on the court, in public health, in medicine, in practice. So you first identify the downstream disparity. And then I always tell people, stand there and look upstream. Look upstream for what we call the causes of the causes. And this was a term that was coined by um, Michael Marmot, actually Sir Michael Marmot, um, who is sort of like a grandfather of the social determinants of health um, framework. And I always tell people, it doesn't matter how far upstream you go. I, and I never disparage all of the great work and all the great interventions and person and family and community-centered um, interventions that we employ and implement. The problem is, oftentimes what happens is the solutions that we develop downstream will provide some relief and help us to address, to some extent, the disparities but it's not really the level where the problem occurred. It's the level where the problem is being experienced. So I always tell people just identify the downstream disparity and then look further upstream for the causes of the causes, and then look to develop and implement solutions and interventions that match the actual level of the problem and the causes of the causes or the root causes of the disparities. And those are where we start to then unpack and address and deal with inequity, this unfair, systematic, structural, social, political um, um, level of difference. So then in working with community, and this is a graphic that's taken out of a, a publication that just came out this year. Um, it was led by a colleague of mine, Dr. Kent Key, um, I'm also a co-author on this. And it uh, really, for us, it was a process where we um, have all been engaged in community engaged and community participatory research for a very long time. And so we work, and we've got lots of community partners who are also a part of this. And we work with those partners to identify, first of all, there's a continuum, and we know that there's a continuum of community engagement um, in research. And I sort of tell people there's no wrong place or no bad place um, to get into um, community engagement. But there's some contextual factors that in the absence of those, oh, there's somebody at my door delivering me flowers. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on one second, one second. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm on a presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a nice treat. I'm super sorry, but I'm sitting and I could see out the window and they were gonna knock on the door anyway. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, guys. Um, Welcome to the Zoom room. So um, there's contextual factors that are absolutely critical um, as you begin to engage community. It includes the history that you have, um, working with community and working with partners, the trust that's been built or damaged over time. Um, and we are now you know, dealing with in the era of COVID and COVID vaccine and COVID vaccine trials. And the question comes up often, how do we restore and rebuild trust um, in communities, right? We've got a, a significant underrepresentation of um, African Americans and other ethnic minorities in many of these vaccine trials. And I always say trust is not something that you can magically put in overnight. Again, it goes to history, relationship building, respect, transparency. These are the kinds of things that have to be built over time through consistent action that aligns with core values. So there are these contextual factors. And then there's also real equity indicators. So who has the power and control? Who's responsible for decision-making? Who has influence? Is everybody benefiting? Who has ownership, both of the process and the outcomes? Who has key responsibility for how things go? What is the, the process for resource sharing? And so it's just important, and there's no right sort of answer here. But if you want to partner with community and move all the way down that continuum to the community-based participatory research line, and you're working in community or with partners where you don't have history, where you don't have trust, how can you possibly then equitably and fairly identify who gets to say what 
decisions get made and how they get made and who owns the data and who owns the outcome and who gets what share of the resources. So this is just really more for people to kind of do a check-in to see are these core factors at play? And if they're not, what I always say to people is it's worthwhile to go and put some of these basic building blocks in so you have a foundation so that no matter where you engage with community on that continuum, there's some context and some equity at play for those relationships. So now I wanna just give a specific example about um, some work that we've been doing around addressing disparities in opioid overdose death. So what the science and the data tells us about opioid overdose death, and um, I'm gonna say what the science tells us. Um, I have some annotations in the, in the notes of my PowerPoint, but I'm giving it to you in a very simple format and sort of 30,000 foot view. Um, so the first thing is that opioid overdose death is preventable and opioid addiction is treatable. We know that we've got good data, good science, good evidence around that. The second thing, the social and political determinants are key drivers of opioid overdose death and disparities. And this is clearly evidenced by the declaration from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. Um, they developed a five-point strategy the declaration was made in 2017 that we were in an opioid epidemic. Um, and if you look at those five um, strategies that they employed, most of them are anchored in addressing systematic and structural that both give rise to opioid misuse, but also prevent people from recovering, even those who seek treatment. So we know that the social and political determinants are key drivers of opioid overdose death and disparities. And then the last piece is that the level of solutions often do not match the level of the problem. So even though we recognize that it's preventable, that it's treatable, oftentimes, instead of treating people and investing dollars in prevention, we've mostly managed it through the criminal justice system. We've made a health problem, a problem that's preventable and treatable, a political problem. Also, instead of dealing with the second piece, which is the social and political determinants, we've often focused on individuals and much of the resource that we allocated prior to 2017 to addressing opioid misuse and opioid overdose death was focused on individuals, not systems and structures and policies. What we know about opioid overdose death disparities to date that opioid overdose death has been historically higher among non-Hispanic whites. 2017 to 2018, following the declaration of an opioid epidemic by the Department of Health and Human Services, marked the first national decline in opioid overdose death. And I'm gonna present some novel data um, that I um, analyzed myself, and it actually just came out today. Um, the, the final printed version just came out today in addiction, if anyone is interested. It's in the journal called Addiction. Um, and so, so we know when we actually mount a public health response, we can impact um, these outcomes, these behavioral health outcomes. And I think death is probably the most severe and worse um, adverse outcome. But there are many other things along the way. But clearly, there's no coming back um, from that. So we did see our first national decline um, in opioid overdose death from 2017 to 2018. But when you go back to, the, to that sort of little basic three-step process that I pointed out, the decline in opioid overdose death that we saw in 2018 was attributable solely to a decline among non-Hispanic whites. And the reason that is the case is because whites are disproportionately represented in the population and so we looked at the overall rate. The numerator was opioid overdose deaths. The denominator was the population at large. Bravo, we all started cheering. The number went down. I put on my health disparities cap, and I said, let me disaggregate the data. When I disaggregated the data, what I saw was there was actually a decline in non-Hispanic whites that was a statistically significant decrease at the same time there was a statistically significant increase among African Americans and Hispanics. This is just a quick snapshot of what that data looked like 
Unfortunately, I, I'm using here national data from the National Vital Statistics System, which is a compilation of all of the um, death records in the United States. I looked over a 20 year period because I wanted to be able to put that data in context. Um, and as you can see, those last two purple dots out here on the end show what the rates for whites look like. And you can see they went down. You can see that bottom line represents um, opioid overdose death for African-Americans, which has historically been low. Um, the acceleration of that rate for African-Americans began in 2012 and continues and persists to this day. This is a joint point regression model. And you can see that there's about a five fold difference in the average annual percent change in opioid overdose death for African-Americans compared to whites. So I'm saying that blacks now outpace whites in opioid overdose death. I'm, unfortunately, for the type of analysis that I wanted to do in looking over time, there just simply aren't enough, enough opioid overdose death cases um, for other races and ethnicities for us to further tease it out. But now that we're starting to see these big differences emerge, I think we can do a little bit more fine-grained analysis. And I don't necessarily have to go back 20 years. But if you put it in context, you can see very, very low flat rate for African-Americans, rapid acceleration in 2012. That acceleration continues to this day. In 2017, declaration of an opioid epidemic by the Department of Health and Human Services, massive rollout in resources. And what do we see the following year? A decrease for white. If we continue along this trend, what's going to happen is those curves are going to cross each other. And the rate's going to then so when I say the rate is outpacing, envision you're in a race. One person might be out in front, but if you're running faster than them, you will eventually catch up to them. And so what I'm saying is, and the declaration that I'm making, is that we basically racialize the rollout of resources and the implementation of what we did to curtail the opioid epidemic. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So in summary, opioid use and opioid overdose death do continue to disproportionately affect whites. But opioid overdose death is increasing more rapidly among blacks than whites, both nationally and we're able to identify that difference in at least 13 states. And there are another 20 states where that is also happening, but the trend is just short of significance because the numbers haven't quite reached that point yet. And it's my goal that we can stop it before that actually happens. So the question is why? Why the black-white gap in opioid overdose death? Well, again, as I said, opioid prevention and intervention efforts, we've got both system and provider bias. One of the things that we notice, and again, working with our uh, community partners, people in the recovery community, working with Medicaid, working with our um, local partners in multiple states, we started to look at what the data are telling us. One of the things that we found is that one of the big strategies is um, that HHS implemented was um, medication-assisted treatment, specifically starting medication-assisted treatment in the emergency department. We know that that works. Anytime you can get somebody into the system of care, getting them, whether they be in the ED for an overdose, whether they be at a primary care appointment, whether they be at a dental appointment, once you've got somebody in a system of care, it is the opportunity to intervene. And so there's been this big push for medication-assisted treatment, specifically starting medication-assisted treatment in the emergency department when people come in. And unfortunately, what we found is that the strongest, the two strongest predictors of who gets that is race. If you're white, you're seven times more likely to be started on medication-assisted treatment than if you're Black or Hispanic, and income. If you're over the median... Um, income in your state, you're substantially more likely to be started on medication-assisted treatment in the ED. So here we have this major innovation, but the way we prioritized and then implemented it, we've left people out of um, that innovation. And, and, and so as a result, not everybody is equitably the beneficiary of that. Another example, and there are multiple reasons, and we're unpacking them. I'm just going to give you a few examples because there are real policy implications that come out of this, and I'll talk about those in just a second. Um, naloxone administration. So naloxone, the 
you know, reverses the um, uh, impact of an opioid. It is a standard prescribing practice that when you prescribe opioids for somebody, um, whether it be for pain management, whether it be in substance abuse treatment, that you um, also um, administer um, naloxone or prescribe naloxone. We're seeing tremendous disparities in prescribing practices related to naloxone. The other thing is, um, when we look at if someone is out in the community and is at risk for opioid overdose death, or in fact, an, an ambulance has been called because um, of a, sus a suspected opioid overdose, oftentimes, depending on where you live, by the time naloxone gets to you, it's just too late. So again, we've got this systematic structural bias and problem in that emergency medical services take substantially longer to get into black and brown communities and impoverished communities than they do into wealthier communities or whiter communities. And so these are systematic and structural problems, not problems that are related to the individual. Last example I wanna give is around recovery-oriented or recovery oriented systems of care. Um, and this was also a part of the um, five-point strategy. And again, we see tremendous disparities in who gets what. So we've been looking locally and tracking Okay, so somebody goes through the treatment system, um, and now what? People deal with things like being unstably housed, employment gaps, education gaps, et cetera. And what we're finding is that if you are white, female, um, and, and the higher SES you are, the better treatment that you're getting in these recovery-oriented systems of care. Um, and we have another um, study that we're doing right now looking at housing placement and job placement for people following treatment episodes and entering into um, um, the sort of recovery phase um, of their process. And what we're finding is that oftentimes, if you're Black or African American, you're not able to access quality housing, even with a housing voucher. But when you compare those people to their white peers, they're able to take those housing vouchers and move into better opportunities residentially than are their um, black peers. So we've just got all kinds of systematic and structural system and provider biases that when we start to unpack them, we think are accounting for why we see um, this gap or difference in um, how people benefit it differentially from um, all of the resources that were rolled out. So some of the future directions that we've identified, the first thing is we must track the disparities. We have to use existing data and we have to use that data at multiple levels. Again, if we just looked at the national data, we were busy patting ourselves on the back thinking that we had done a great thing and we did. However, we did not make sure that those things were done equitably and we don't have the kinds of systems and structures and policies in place to ensure that things are being implemented equitably. We need an expansion of the DHHHS five-point strategy to specifically include language and provisions to ensure equity and how these resources get allocated, how these evidence-based interventions and promising practices are also being implemented. The second thing is equity must be mandated, it must be measured, and it has to be money-driven. I always say, if you want to understand what people's values are, you look at how they spend their money. We need to mandate measurement and improvement by legislation. And I'll give you a great example of what happened during COVID-19. During COVID-19, the federal government rolled out a lot of money for COVID testing in some of our most vulnerable, socially vulnerable and marginalized communities. That money was primarily rolled out through our federally qualified health centers. By very definition, federally qualified health centers are located in medically underserved areas, and their primary goal is to serve the medically underserved. What we found when we actually went and looked at and disaggregated the data is that for many of the FQHCs, the populations that benefited and that they were serving with that testing did not mirror the population in the communities where they were located, nor did it mirror their patient population it was typically a slightly older population, it was a slightly wealthier population, and in many places it was a, a, a substantially whiter um, population. And so the, the thing that I think is they rolled that money out 
They gave it to the FQHCs. There was a, a natural sort of, um, I guess, assumption that it would then go to serve that community, but it wasn't required in the in the allocation of the resources, and, and there was no mandate that the people you test have to mirror the community that you serve or mirror the population that your FQHC serves. So just that one little missing feature, had it be that our natural drift, and I always say this, our natural drift is towards inequity. If we are not intentionally mandating, measuring, and legislating equity, our natural drift, even for well-meaning things that have no inequity built into them, because as a society we are inequitable and things are unfair, our natural drift is toward inequity. We have to link equity to funding also for researchers and as well to payments to providers. And one example that I love and something that we're doing in Michigan, they have a very strong health equity group in our um, Department of Medicaid. And so what Medicaid does is we saw we've got all these disparities and, and outcomes, but then we, again, looked upstream and said, where is this coming from? So we picked 15 indicators, and I'll just give you an example. One of them was um, uh, people getting medication, medication-assisted medication treatment for opioid use disorders in the emergency department. And when we looked, we saw that the referral rates, starting people on treatment and then the referral rates for treatment and then the follow-up care was substantially higher. In Michigan, it was substantially higher for whites and for men. And so we thought, well, this has something to do with how providers are then operationalizing these mandates that we start people on medication-assisted treatment in the emergency department. And so what Medicaid did here is they picked these 15 indicators and they said, and it varied a little bit by indicators, but roughly they said, we will tolerate no more than a 5% difference in who gets what. And when I tell you, it seems crazy that we would tolerate any difference. But if you actually look at the data, in some counties, there was more than a 70% difference. And I'm saying 70%, that's not relative, where you might have 10% of African Americans are being started on medication-assisted treatment, but 80% of whites are. So it's more like a seven, eight fold difference in what we were seeing. So narrowing that down and mandating and legislating, if you have more than a 5% difference, you are now no longer eligible for your incentive payment. What we saw is without any other intervention other than just mandating it and linking it to payments, linking it to money, linking it to the things that matter for providers, many of them were not able to hit that 5% threshold, but they were able to decrease that, that difference rapidly and in a very short period of time. There was no training, there was no telling them how to do it, but linking it to something that mattered to them, making it required, they automatically sort of dealt with themselves. Another future direction, we need a stronger emphasis on translational as well as dissemination and implementation research to bridge the leaky pipeline from research to practice. So there are a lot of things that we know but we don't then, aren't then able to get those things out into the world. And this is a graphic that we created at my center, the Flint Wasse My Center, it's our center. It's very community engaged. We got, it's the baby with many, many mamas. Um, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. And we, it's called the seven year odyssey and we didn't coin that term. But what that points to is it takes roughly 17 years for only 14% of research to be translated into practice. So from the time some bright-eyed, bushy-tailed investigator, researcher has an idea, there's a priority or some funding that maps onto that, by the time it actually gets you know, all the way out the pipe and translates to anything in practice, 17 years on average have passed, and only 14% of that research ever is translated, which means the rest of it sort of dies on the vine or in some scientific journal somewhere. And I think a part of the problem with this is because there's a disconnect. We need the funders to increase the emphasis on dissemination and implementation research. So we know things work. We have a good idea about what things work, but we don't incentivize nor encourage nor fund substantially how to then get that knowledge and that information up and out 
scaled up and out in the community in a way that's both meaningful. I um, did a search in um, NIH Reporter, and there's more than 12,000 active NIH slash Health and Human Services project with the word trial in the keyword or the abstract search, and less than a quarter of that with the word implementation in the keyword or the abstract search. So it really, to me, is sort of a, a perverse incentive. It, you're more likely to get funded if you take something that already works and add some tweak to it and randomize people, et cetera, and conduct trials research than you ever are if you do implementation research. So that's a good policy intervention that I think um, we need. Another future direction is strengthening the practice to research slash policy um, pathway. And what I say, the proposed model, the way I was trained is we talked about research to practice to policy or research to policy to practice. And I love this story, I'll be very brief. Um, I was at a, a Annie Casey um, uh, workshop uh, around community engaged research probably a decade ago. And, and, and it was sort of an exercise to get us to see how, how different we are in our thinking and how big the divide is oftentimes between research and policy and practice. So you had policymakers and activists and advocates. You had a bunch of practitioners, so people on the ground floor sort of doing the work, interacting with people. And then there was a group of researchers. And of course, I'm in with a group of researchers. And they say, they gave us all a problem. And they said, how would you solve the problem? And the practice people went first. And they said, well, you know, they start laying out, we would do this and we would do that and we would do that. And we would bring in these stakeholders and we would do this and we would do that. And it was very detailed. It really got down to the nitty gritty. Why? Because these are the people who are doing the work and they actually know what works in practice. And the research people, we were a little embarrassed, right? Because we ended up coming up with what? some randomized control trial that would help us to better answer the question to then figure out what to do. And it was a little embarrassing because what they presented was just so detailed, clearly practice informed. And one of my colleagues at the end, they said, anybody have any questions or comments? And my colleague raises his hand and he says, well, I understand that that works in practice, but does it work in theory? And it was like the whole room burst out laughing, except the researchers, because we were like, yeah, does it work in theory? And so we, I think we've just gotten it backwards, right? There's a lot that could be learned and gleaned, both from practice that could then inform research that would then strengthen policy. And I think it's important because I always tell people, evidence is not what informs policy. I wish it were that simple. Evidence, pol politicians influence policy. Policymakers influence policy. If you're fortunate, you can have your research and your evidence influence policymakers to then write policy that maps onto good research and good practice. And so I think we need to think about this as all of these things can be bi-directional and there's a lot that we can be informed by from practice. Um, and then the last thing, and it relates to the other thing, which is equitable partnerships with practitioners, policymakers, advocates, other researchers, and most importantly, with the communities that we serve. We often leave community out and have a bad habit of doing it to them or for them or on their behalf. And on their behalf without their permission is the same as doing it to them. Um, and so I think it's really important that we have room for community at the table. And so, so I'm going to wrap up in just the next two minutes. And so what can individuals and organizations do? Um, and I get this question often. People say, well, what can I do? And so I want to throw a few things out specifically that I think we're not talking about enough, but I do think that it's important, is that it's important that you use your positions of power to elevate people of color, to elevate diverse leaders, and to elevate the voices of community. Um, I, I'm assuming most of the people who are listening in on this are in some type of position of power, whether you be a student, a graduate student, a faculty member, an administrator, you know, the fact that we're all here, there's some degree of privilege that comes with that. And I think we need to be using those positions of privilege and power to elevate those who have been marginalized and those who have historically been left out, especially the communities that we serve. 
Um, it's important for people to be willing organizationally to conduct a fearless inventory of equity within your organizations. And that relates to things like salaries, positions, who does what, all of that, as well as health equity in the populations and the communities that you serve. And more importantly, harken back to the example of the COVID testing, the, com the people and populations that are a part of your mission, but that you are not adequately serving. Um, and then we need to look at the services and provision of those services by race, ethnicity, and other disparities and other disparate groups. And the last thing is we need qualified and resource diversity officers and offices in the C-suite. And they should be qualified just being a, a racial ethnic minority or being a woman or being from a disadvantaged background does not necessarily qualify somebody to lead diversity um, initiatives. And oftentimes these types of roles are not resourced. Um, so you might have a diversity officer, but there's no budget, there's no, you know, anything, there's no way to move anything forward. And I do believe fundamentally that those things need to be in the C-suite um, of the organization as well as at other levels. And so I talked today about, and I sort of made the black-white comparison with opioids because it is the most striking um, difference that we see. But I want to um, make it really clear, we have many other disparate populations, other racial ethnic minorities. We're seeing that in COVID, and we see that with a lot of health conditions, persons with pre-existing and or chronic health conditions, um, socially vulnerable and people living in poverty, including um, people in rural communities, prisoners and other institutionalized populations, sexual and gender minorities, the uninsured, elderly, and undocumented residents and non-native non -native English speakers and people with language barriers. I could add a lot more. I just never wanna leave people with, it's only a black white thing, it's not. We now know it's been inescapable for all of us that we live in a very unfair and unequitable um, society. And I think it is for us to take up the mantle and sort of bridge those gaps. So my sort of big take home messages the social and political determinants of health are driving opioid overdose death and likely other behavioral health and other health inequities. The level of solutions, i.e. the level of the interventions, whether they be policy interventions, community level interventions, et cetera, often do not, but they should match the level of the problems. We invest a lot on our downstream work and it is just critical. I don't care if you get to the middle of the river, we've got to start moving more upstream and mounting solutions that actually are a better match for the level of the problems. And that equity must be built in to the allocation of resources, and it must be mandated to assure fairness. And community must have a voice. It's critical that we not do it to people or for people, but that we do it with them. People should have a say. That's it for me. That's my contact information. Uh, my email, holdenc3 at msu.edu, um, on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that. I am Dr. Deb for Holden. And I always put this up. Nobody ever uses it, but my cell phone number's up too, and that's 443-226-2807. I live in Flint, Michigan. I have a Baltimore cell phone number because I've had the same cell phone number for 24 years. And if anybody ever wants to reach me, it's important to me that I keep that same number. So that's why I still have a Baltimore cell phone number. And that's it. Thank you so much, Deborah, uh, Dr. Okay. Burkholden. So we have the chat feature open on the YouTube um, channel, but I know I was having trouble logging into that, but that seems to be the theme of my day um, or, or maybe the past few months for me with technology difficulties. Um, if others are on and, and have some questions that they want to put in the chat box, uh, we'll see them and we can field those. As we wait for those to roll in, if people are able to access that feature, I did have a question for you. Um, you know, you, you were talking about how money, where we invest our money really shows what our, what we deem as important. And I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, as faculty, it's really important that people get grants to support their, their good work. How do we get NIH and other funders to offer more opportunities on, you know, either implementation types of projects or, you know, projects that are more community-based. I've seen some changes over the past years where there are more, but it's still not in my mind where it needs to be. What are your thoughts about that? So this is great. And that's a really great question, Amy. So I just did a, um, 
I just did a webinar with Dr. Francis Collins, who's the um, director of the NIH. We were actually, actually scheduled to do a, a webinar with Dr. Fauci. He had polyp surgery. So I just sort of hit the jackpot and ended up having this very real conversation um, with Dr. Collins. And I'll tell you what came out of it. Uh, and he's really extraordinary in many, many ways. And again, and I want to say something um, that I didn't quite say to him, but I did say to him, you should put this on your people. That example of if you just build it into the money and you mandate it, people will figure it out. He really loved that notion because he acknowledged that what well, we've tried. So, so the, the question that he asked me was, how do we get um, you know, racial ethnic minorities, specifically African-Americans, to be um, more participatory in these COVID vaccine trials. And I had, in advance of that call, looked up the billion dollars that they had rolled out. And the number is over a billion. I just looked at one billion for a particular initiative that they had rolled out for the COVID vaccine work. And all of the PIs are white. Most of them are older white men. And I said, the price to break into. And so I said to him, you should have a requirement. I see the report that NIH just put out. They put one out every couple of years and they point back to the same thing. And they say, you know, we've tried these programs, we've done this. However, given that we still have underrepresentation of, and then they name all the same usual suspects. They've made some progress when it comes to women, but they actually have an office that deals with that specifically. They have specific set aside programs and dollars to build better pipeline for women investigators. And it's only a very small amount of their budget. They don't have something similar for community engaged research. They don't have something similar for underrepresented minority investigators. The only NIH FOAs that you will find dedicated for HBCUs are training programs, R25s. And my thing is how are, how are minority investigators supposed to train and help build this pipeline when they can't get in the pipeline of getting the research dollars? Where are they supposed to be training these students from and, and built on what and based on what? And so my recommendation to Dr. Collins was, you've got to mandate this. And now I guess my recommendation to President Trump would be that he has to mandate diversity for the NIH. And I bet you they would figure it out. So I think what we need are specific set asides that require um, diversity or that are earmarked for diverse investigators. And we need, um, and it doesn't have to be every single thing. And I always tell people, every single morsel of your research will not lend itself well or in the same way for community engaged or community partnered, you know, or even community informed research. But if we don't require that people even attempt or look and if we don't then have money specifically earmarked for the people who are doing the work that does and that needs it and that is enriched and better and more sustainable because of it, it won't happen. And so I think that's where we need to do. We need to, it needs to be mandated and it needs to be earmarked and it needs to have real criteria. There need to be reviewers who have that lens and are able to sort of wade through good grantsmanship and distinguish between good grantsmanship versus authentic community partnership. Um, and Dr. Collins was very open to that. So I sort of put all of my thoughts together. I did this in partnership with the Rainbow Push Coalition and the National Medical Association, and gave we gave them a list of what they could be doing instead of mounting one more pipeline program. How about we deal with the people that are even here right now who would support pipeline if they were resourced to do it. Fantastic. Uh, can you, I'm not sure if you can see the questions uh, on YouTube, but there was another question that came in from Laura Kelly. I can read it to you if that's helpful. Oh, no, I have, look, I got it right here. You got it, okay, Kelly. great. I just couldn't look at it because I can see myself here too. Um, so let's see, do you have any advice for early career investigators like me who are intimidated by NIH grant writing, but are interested in participatory action, dissemination, and implementation and substance use research. 
So that is a great question. So this is this is an interesting one because it sort of reminds me of the um, like it's like kind of like the credit phenomenon, right? It it takes credit to get credit. And I got my first credit card when I was in college, and of course I fumbled it and you know didn't didn't do so well with it. But then you know I figured it out and I set it up for auto payment and then I paid it on time every month and. After a year or two, I started getting the, you're pre-approved for this new credit card. Get, breaking into that world, and it is very intimidating, and I will tell you, it's even intimidating for, not intimidating, but it's, it's um, for even seasoned investigators, it's, it's, it's a difficult world. And I always tell people, it's not a world for winners, it's a world for players. I think the average hit rate at NIH right now is somewhere between 15 and 18%. It varies a little bit by institute for your second submission. So that means more than 80% of grants that where you have poured your heart and soul and all of your brilliance and all of that in and then gotten the critique and took it and revised it and resubmitted it, 80% of that stuff dies on your laptop, right? And so what I always tell people is there are, and we've done a much better job at just overall broadening the pipeline um, for investigators. So the key is how do you get that first win on the board? How do you how do you just break in? And I tell people, you wanna take advantage, one, of your early stage investigator status. Early stage investigator is less than 10 years at, upon the completion of your terminal degree. So if you your terminal degree is a PhD, 10 years from when you receive that PhD, you are in a priority group for review and for funding because they have mandated, we've got to bring more newcomers into the pipeline. So take advantage of your early stage investigator status. There's also priority given for new investigators. New investigators are defined by NIH as people who have not yet had an R01. You could have had an RO3, a smaller grant, a supplement, et cetera. You want to take advantage of that status. You also, I cannot underscore enough how important it is to have a mentor and not a mentor who really likes you and thinks you're great, but a mentor who has had some success in navigating these waters and is willing to give you that tough and critical feedback the best thing you can do is whenever you even submit anything, it should be the best that it can be, right? We now have the opportunity you can submit things. There, you used to be able to resubmit something twice. Now you can only resubmit it once. You want to jump up and shoot your best shot on your very first submission. And the best way to do that is to have a seasoned investigator with their eyes on your work, giving you the critical feedback, and it is your job to be very coachable and to take that feedback because it's much better getting it pre-review than getting it when you get your pink sheets back from a reviewer and hearing what your so-called peers thought about your work. As far as the focus on um, dissemination, implementation, um, and participatory research, there are institutes and there are agencies and there are branches within institutes. So as an example, NHLBI now has a full branch devoted to dissemination and implementation science. They have a big commitment to early stage and new investigators. NIDA has um, a program officer, only because you asked specifically about um, substance abuse research. Um, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has um, a program officer that specifically focuses on dissemination and implementation research. You want to figure out who these folks are and you start to build rapport with them now so that they know who you are and they keep you on their radar. Because what'll happen is as new funding opportunities come out or as new opportunities arise, either for funding or for training or programs to increase pipeline, they'll reach out to you. So it's one of those things where it's not changing as fast as any of us would like, but there are some things out and it's important that people be able to plug into them and that you've got a strong mentor Ideally, they would be at your institution because you also have to navigate institutions, but they don't actually have to be at your institution to be a strong mentor and somebody who's willing to support you to get into that pipeline. 
Thank you so much. We're at the end of the hour here, so we will wrap things up. But um, just our thanks again for joining us when it's such a busy time. And um, yeah. Love seeing the flowers that came in, and, and, and clearly uh, we we should send some to you for your time today. Much appreciated. Um, oh, thanks no. on everyone's behalf to Dr. Deborah for holding, and appreciate you sharing your contact information for future follow up. Take care. All right, great. Thanks. Okay, and don't forget tell people like and subscribe the In Chip YouTube. If you're watching the YouTube, like and subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.